Hello everyone, my name is Daniel and I'm a programmer and an artist. And today I thought we'd take a look at my dashed curve node group. Um, and then maybe do a quick look at some updates I did to some of the nodes I've already made videos about because um, a few of them have changed. Um, the curve dash node is part of my geometry nodes asset collection, which you can see all of the nodes that are in that here. Um, and that whole collection is available on my Gumroad page. It's available for free, so if it looks interesting to you, uh, check it out. Let's take a quick look at the curve dash node. The way the curve dash node works is it takes an input curve, you define a dash length, and it will split the curve into segments of that length. So if we turn this down, you can see the dashes get smaller, and if you turn it up, they get longer. Um, the dash resolution controls how many points there should be in each segment of the dashed curve. And then the dash pad start and end values let you control what part of the of each segment you want to keep. So if we turn it, so if we turn it down to, to zero, you get the whole curve again, but it's actually divided into segments still here and here. Um, and then if you turn it up, one of those up to one, it would go all the way to the other end. And so by adjusting those values, you can slide the dash, make the dash longer and shorter, stuff like that. All right, so let's go through the node tree. Um, the first thing we have is an option to resample it or not. We just check if the resample value um, equals zero or not. So if it's very close to zero, then we'll just use the input geometry. If it is greater than zero, we can resample the curve. And then whichever one of those we decide to use will output from the switch and that'll be our adjusted input geometry. Then we want to create some lines which are going to be our dashes. So I have here a mesh line and we put our dash resolution into the count of the vertices for the line. And then we want to capture an attribute on that which is going to be the index of that line. So we have a resolution of five so it's going to have uh, we'll have a line here with five points in it something like that. Um, and each of those will be assigned a number 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Once we've captured those indexes on the initial line, we're going to turn it into an instance so we can make a bunch of copies of it. And then we're going to duplicate or make copies of that line um, for the number of splines that there are in our input geometry. Because we want our we want to be able to make dashes. So to that. We want to be able to make dashes um, on every curve in or every spline in our curves. So if we have three splines in our curve geometry, then when we're done, we want all three of those to be dashed. Um, so, so first thing, we, we make the line, then we're going to make a copy of the line for each spline in the curve. So once we've duplicated them, we'll have, since we have three splines, we'll have three mesh lines, each with five points in it. The next thing we need to know is how many segments each spline in our curve should be divided into, um, which will be different depending on the length of the curves. If, if they're shorter or longer, they'll need a different number of dashes to fill that length of spline. So the first thing we'll need is our dash length, which we can just get from the input. And then for each of our three copies of our mesh lines, each of those are assigned to a spline. So we can sample a value from an index off of the splines of our input curve, and we can get the spline length. So each of our copied lines is now assigned a spline length from our three input splines. We can divide that length by our dash length, and then if we round that, we will get the number of segments we need to fill that spline. Once we know the number of segments we need to create for each spline, we can duplicate our mesh edges again, this time using the spline segments as for the amount. And that'll give us a bunch of copies of that mesh line where each spline is assigned a number of instances equal to the spline segments needed to fill the length. Um, we then need to know where to position those segments because currently they're all still coming out from zero, zero. The way we can do that is um, by first realizing the instances so that we have meshes with points to work with again. And then we can set the positions on our mesh lines by evaluating the input curves. So that's what we're doing here with this sample curve. Um, 
on the sample curve, we're going to pass a value through. Um, that value is going to be the radius and the tilt. We're just combining them to x, y, z so we can do it with one sample curve instead of needing two. So that's the value is our radius and tilt, so we can reapply that. And then it automatically gives you the position, which we're going to use to set the positions of our the vertices in the mesh lines. We need to know where to set the position to, though. So that's where this factor value comes in. The factor is on each curve. It'll go from zero on the one end up to one on the other end. Um, so we need to calculate that for each of our mesh lines. We can calculate the factor for sampling the curve by doing some math on our indices. Um, we're going to eventually add two factors together. Those two values are going to calculate first the starting point of a segment, and then a factor that puts each subsequent vertex in a mesh line further along the curve than that starting point, depending on which vertex it is in the line. So to calculate the starting point of a segment, um, all we need to do is divide the index of our duplicate by the number of segments that are assigned to that spline. And that looks like this. You can see it starts at 0 and then increases up to 1. The second value is um, for a mesh line. We captured way back at the beginning, we captured the index of the vertex. Since there's five points, it goes from 0 up to 4. Um, we're going to take that value and divide it by the dash resolution minus 1. The reason we subtract 1 is if our index goes from 0 to 4 and our dash resolution is 5 and we want the final value in our sequence to be 1, so we subtract 1 so that that ends up being index 4 divided by resolution 4, which equals 1. That value looks like this. You can see that each segment starts at 0 and then goes up to 1. 0 up to 1, 0 up to 1. Once we have that 0 to 1 range, we want to divide it by the number of segments on our spline, which will convert it from going from 0 to 1 to, in this case, 0 to 0.33, since there's three segments. That looks like this. You can see that this longer one that has more in it, they're a darker value. But then if we add that to our spline indexes, we'll get a gradient that goes all the way across the curve. And then we can use that value as the factor to sample the curve. Once we plug that factor into the sample curve node, we can use the position we get as a result to set the position of, our, of the vertices in our mesh. And if we then convert that to a curve, we end up with a curve that looks identical to our input geometry but is actually divided into segments. Then if you remember when we sampled the curve, we passed a value into that. That value is the radius in the x and the tilt in the y of a vector. If we separate that x, y, z, we can set the curve tilt and the curve radius so that to see that we can add a solidify here. And then we can modify the radius and the tilt. You can see that passes through. Then once we've set the curve tilt and the curve radius, we can just take our pad start and end values. I have the subtract in here just to invert the pad end values so that when you set it to 0.2, it's 0.2 in from the end rather than 0.2 from the start. The subtract is just a personal preference thing, really. Um, if you plug those into a trim curve node, we have our each of our splines is divided into segments. Each of those is a curve now, so so if you trim each curve the same way, you get dashes. And they can be twisted. You can sweep the curve with a shape. Um, you can scale the radius, whatever you want to do. And that's it for the curve dash node. I also had a couple of updates I wanted to mention about some of the nodes I've made videos about previously. One of those is the rope wrap node. I'm, you'll remember if you watched that video that I have this beam direction node that's tries to calculate the direction of each beam. The way I was doing that previously was I was using ray casts and I was ray casting like into the beam from itself to figure out which ray cast went the furthest and then keeping the long the longest vectors from that and using that to guess an average direction. I thought of a much simpler way to do it. What we can do instead of ray casting is we can just accumulate the position of all of our vertices grouped by the mesh island 
And then we can accumulate a value that just counts up by one, also grouped by the island index. Then the total of this accumulate field will be the number of vertices in that mesh island. And this will be the sum of the positions of every single vertice in the mesh island. If you divide those, you get the average position of the vertices, which if the vertices in your mesh island are distributed fairly evenly, will should be approximately the center of the mesh. If we then subtract that average center from the original position of the vertex, we'll get a vector that points from our average center to that to each vertex. If we then use our sign of largest component, which um, takes the XYZ components of a vector and figures out which one's the longest, and then it returns the sign of that component. That'll get us the sign of the largest component, which will either be a, a one or a negative one, depending on if the largest component was pointing in the negative or positive direction. If we then scale our vectors that go from the center of the mesh to the vertices by the sign of their largest component, it should flip all the ones that point in a negative direction around so that they also point in, a, in the positive direction. Once we flip the negative vectors so that they're all pointing in the same direction, we can accumulate a field again, but again grouped by the island index. And then we can take the total of that accumulated direction from center vector and capture it on our, the faces of our beams. And that looks like this. And if we rotate a beam, you can see you get different colored vectors depending on which way the beam is facing. The other thing I updated was the curve solidify and the curve sweep node. The curve solidify now just uses the curve sweep inside of it, which makes that simpler. And then the curve sweep got improved so that it accurately creates UVs if the curve is cyclic. And the way I do that is where I was previously capturing the length of the spline and assigning that to the U coordinate. I now instead am building the U coordinate in the same way that we build the V coordinate. And the way we do that is by capturing the index of the, of the point in the spline. Again, here we're combining a vector just to pass a bunch of values through at once. And then we're going to separate that vector to, to use them again. Um, then we take that index value, which goes in the Z component of the vector. We're going to get the Z component out again. And we're going to do our count faces, which again just gets the first vertex of a face and reads the value off that vertex instead of off the face. We're going to assign that value to a face, which looks like this. Starts at zero, goes around to one. Same as when you go around, same as when you go around this way for the V coordinate. And then we're again going to have to calculate um, from the faces of the corner. We're going to figure out is it the second vertex or is it or the third vertex? If it's either of those, we'll get a value of one. Otherwise, we'll get a value of zero, and we'll use that to. And we'll use that to get these gradients that go along each face. And then if we add our step value with the gradient value together, we'll get, some, we'll get a gradient that's smooth and goes all the way around the circle like this. If we then divide that by the number of points in the input spline, you can see all the way back here, we capture the point count is the Y component. We take the Y component here, comes all the way across we're going to divide our gradient, which goes from like zero to 32 or something by the number of points in the input spline, which is 32. That'll make it go from zero to one. And then if we, and then the X component of that vector we made is the length of the spline. So if we multiply our zero to one U coordinate by the length of the spline, we'll get UV coordinates that are consistent no matter how long you make your curves. So it looks like this. Then we can plug that into our combined XYZ to get our UV coordinates. The other thing I added here was the ability to add a texture offset per curve because as you can see right now, each of these curves gets exactly the same texture. If you increase this randomized UV value, you'll get a different part of the texture for each curve. The way we do that is we just take the island index into a ran as the ID for a random value and we set the maximum of that random vector to be our randomized UV input. And then we just add that to the UV coordinates. And this is clamped to a zero to one range. Then same as before, we store that as a named 2D vector on the face corners and send it out as our output. 
All right, so that's all I wanted to cover in this video. Um, hopefully you found the curved dash node interesting. These are all my nodes again. They're available on my Gumroad page for free, or if you want to give me something for them, I always appreciate that as well. That's all I've got for now, so thanks for watching.